بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله This is lesson 7 Alhamdulillah and we have now reached the part in Surah Al-Fatiha where we make a request. Remember several lessons ago we were talking about the various names that the ulama have given to Surah Al-Fatiha. One of the names they gave to this chapter is Suratu Ta'aleem al Mas'ala, the chapter that instructs us on how to ask Allah. That's one of the names of the chapter, according to many of the early ulama. Meaning, this chapter teaches us how to best call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We remember that. The first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising Himself as the Lord of all that exist. And this evokes a state of mahabbah, of love of Allah ta'ala. The next verse, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, speaks of Allah as the universally compassionate and the specifically compassionate. And this evokes feelings of hope. And then he says, Maliki Yawmiddin, or Maliki Yawmiddin, the master or the sovereign of the day of judgment. And this evokes feelings of fear. And we said that these are the three central A'mal al Qulub, actions of the heart that need to animate our worship. And we worship Allah Ta'ala generally with a state of love, hope, and fear. This is not to say that these are all equal. Some are superior to others. Of the three, love, hope, and fear, which one would you say is the superior state, the superior love. action of the heart? Love. Exactly, it's love. Love is the foundation because why? You hope for something that you have not yet attained. And you fear something that may or may not happen in the future. So when the person enters Jannah, the mu'min enters paradise, they will have attained what they hoped for, and they will have been saved from what they feared. But what So hope as an action of the heart is in dunya, it's not really in the hereafter meaning not in Jannah. Fear is an action of the heart. If we talk about fear of hell or fear of divine anger, that's removed. That's, there's no fear. La خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There's no fear upon them in Jannah. So that state is also removed. But what remains is mahabba, is love of Allah Ta'ala. That's why it's mentioned or implied, I should say, in the first verse. Love followed by hope followed by fear. So we have all three of these. So it's in that state of love, hope, and fear that we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ The first verse that mentions verbs. You alone we worship, and in you alone we seek help. Last week we, or last class rather, we talked about the meanings of iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in from a lot of different perspectives. But the important thing to remember is that it is the first expression of action in the, in the chapter after mentioning the three verses Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. After all of that, we come to the actual dua. The dua is after all of these things. And this is why the scholars say that this chapter, among its many names, is 
Suratu Ta'alim al Masala, the chapter that teaches you the adab of making dua, the adab of dua. And this means that the adab is for you to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to extol Allah ta'ala, to thank Him and praise Him. And then after all of that, you mention your request. Of course, in any given moment, a person can raise their hands and immediately ask Allah for anything without any of these muqaddimat. But the adab of dua is that you praise and thank Allah first and then you ask for your dua. Another etiquette of the dua, and this is a long topic, we'll talk about inshallah in the future. Another etiquette of dua is that you be, before you mention your dua, and after you mention your dua, you should include salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And there are some hadith to this effect. There's the hadith recorded by Imam al-Tabarani, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Do not take me or treat me as uh, a water skin." What does that mean? A water skin. You think of the animal skin that's fashioned and made to hold water. That was the way people carried and contained water back in the day. He said, do not make me like the water skin where it's hanging up and you use it when you need it and then you discard it. And then he says, uh, invoke salawat upon me in the beginning and end of your du'as. So this hadith teaches us the etiquette of salawat as well. One of the great early imams, Imam Abu Sulaiman al darrani rahimahullah, he says that, you should send salawat in the beginning before your dua, in the middle of your dua, and at the end of your dua. Because that itself is a dua. And you know with yaqeen, with absolute certainty, that the salawat upon the Prophet wasallam are accepted. They are maqbula qat'an. They are accepted. And that is clear cut with certainty. So... Your own dua, maybe Allah accepts the dua, maybe He doesn't, but He accepts the salawat. So Imam Abu Sulaiman al darrani said, mention salawat in the beginning, middle, and end, because that's accepted guaranteed. And Allah is too kareem, too generous, to accept what's in the beginning, the middle, and end, and reject what's in between. So that's one of the etiquettes as well. So after all of these things, we come now to the verse where the request is made. In Arabic, when you say ihdina, grammatically speaking, this is called fi'l amr, which translates as command verb. But we don't really call it command because the fi'l amr, the command verb, is taken from two perspectives. If it is from one on high to one lower, this would be called fi'l amr. If it is from one uh, of a lower status to one of a higher status, you don't call it a command verb as such. You will call it talab or request. Right? So this is a talab. The talab is what? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, which we typically find translated as guide us to the straight path. And that's an accurate translation, but we want to explore the deeper meanings of this verse. What is the meaning of hidayah or huda, guidance? What is the meaning of sirat, sirat or sirat? And what is the meaning of mustaqim? And what are the implications of this verse in the deeper understanding? So ihdina is saying guide us. And this is from the word hidayah or huda. And in Arabic, the word huda or hidayah, it means irshad and dalala. In Arabic, irshad and dalala. Irshad, I think, is also an Urdu word. Irshad means to guide or to direct. And dalala is also to guide or to direct or to point out. A dalil is a guide, right? If you're going from point A to point B in a desert and you need a travel guide, 
that travel guide is called a dalil. Right? So dalala is pointing in the right direction, taking you the correct route. That's the linguistic meaning of hidayah or huda, dalala or irshad. Uh, according to the scholar of Arabic, Al Imam Al Anbari, he says, Aslu Luhuda fi kalam al Arab at Tawfiq. He says that the, the original meaning of Huda in the Arabic language is Tawfiq. And Tawfiq has, we, we sometimes translate that as success, but really it means to be enabled. To be enabled. Some translated as enabling grace. Uh, and there's lots of meanings for tawfiq in lots of forms, but tawfiq is basically to be given the ability to take the right course. That's tawfiq. We come to another meaning that is mentioned by one of the great early imams, Imam al raghib al-Asfahani, rahimahullah. He has a dictionary of all of the root words found in the Qur'an. It's a very useful book. He also has another uh, uh, very important work called Al-Zakhira ila Makarim al-Shari'a. It's a book on ethics and virtues. He talks about Huda and Hidayah and he says that Al-Hidayah dalalatun bilutf. Right? This is a heavyweight scholar of Arabic telling us this, that the meaning of Hidayah is Dalala bilutf, which means to point someone in the right direction, to guide them with gentleness, with gentleness, lutf, with kindness, with benevolence. He says, when you look at the root words of Hidayah, you find what letters? Ha, dal, ya. Another word in Arabic from this root is hadiyah. What does hadiyah mean? It's a gift. He says that they come from the same root. One is to be guided and one is to be gifted. And ultimately, from this we learn something very important. What do you think it is? Uh, Guidance is a gift. Guidance is a gift. Right? This, that's the big lesson. This is just something of the linguistic meaning. We always look at the linguistic meaning in the Arabic language, and then we look at the applied meaning within the Qur'an and within the Sunnah. And when we look in the Qur'an, we see the word guidance used for a variety of meanings in a variety of contexts. And it is mentioned in the Qur'an in over 250 places. Now, when you look at those 250 places, you can see they can be reduced to around 17 or 18 contexts, or if you reduce those further, about four broad types of guidance. So what I wanna do is just briefly look at a basic list of the different contexts in which the word guidance is mentioned in the Quran, and then look at the four broader, the four basic types uh, also mentioned by Imam Raghab al-Asfahani. Now, what I'm quoting for you today is taken from a very uh, a very powerful work called Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Qur'an, which is a book, a book by Imam al-Suyuti, uh, something of a summary of an earlier work on the sciences of the Qur'an. So when he talks about the sciences of the Qur'an, he looks at the issue of words that have single roots but multiple different meanings based on context. And he explores the meaning of hidayah in the Qur'an and identifies about 17 or 18 different contexts for which it's mentioned. We have, and in all of this, we get a deeper understanding of hidayah that we ask Allah for in this verse, ihdina siratul mustaqim. We have the meaning of bayan, which means clarity, clarity, bayan, for things to be made clear, bayan. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Insan, إِنَّا هَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلَ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا We have guided him to the path. Here it means we've made clear what the path is. إِمَّا شَاكِرًا He's either going to be grateful and take the path, 
or he rejects it. Right? This doesn't mean they're on the straight path. It means they've been shown and it's been explained to them what the path is. This is called bayan, clarification. We also find in Surah Fussilat, وَأَمَّا ثَمُودُ فَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ As for Thamud, we guided them. But what happened to Thamud? They were destroyed, weren't they? So what is the guidance here? Allah is saying, we guided them, the people of Thamud. فَاسْتَحَبُّ الْعَمْيَ عَلَى الْهُدَى But they preferred blindness over Huda, guide, guidance, the clarification. So they were shown the way, but they made a choice to reject it. Another meaning for Huda or Hidayah is the deen of Islam. As Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهُ هُوَ الْهُدَى Indeed, the Huda of Allah is right guidance, meaning the deen of Islam. In some context, Huda is Iman, faith itself. In the story of the boys and the, ca- the young men in the cave, Allah Ta'ala mentions, وَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda. We increase them in Huda. So they were already guided and they received an increase. This means an increase in Iman. Sometimes Huda means invitation, da'wa. We see that in Surah Al-Anbiya, where Allah Ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا And we made them imams guiding others by our command. Meaning calling to people, inviting. This is about the prophets. We made leaders from among them guiding people, meaning instructing them, calling them to Allah. There is the meaning of dalala in irshad, we mentioned earlier, of pointing out the path. As Allah Ta'ala mentions, about Prophet Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha when he mentioned to his family in the Anastu Nara I've seen a fire at a great distance and he wanted to go travel to this fire and he told them that to go find a, a, a brand meaning a, a piece of fire to take back or I find guidance at the fire what does he mean by that? What he means is he may find someone there attending to the fire who can tell him the route during his journey. Um, likewise, in Surah An-Nahl, Allah Ta'ala says, وَعَلَامَاتْ وَبِالنَّجْمِ هُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ Allah Ta'ala mentions the signs and how by the stars they are guided. This doesn't mean guidance as in <laughs> astrology. It means using the stars for finding your way by land and by sea. So navigation by the stars. Sometimes the word Huda refers to the person of the Prophet Wasallam, And this is found in Surah Al-Baqarah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى Those who can see what we have sent down of clarification and guidance. In this verse, according to some tafsir, it means the guidance is referring to the person of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes Huda is Qur'an. وَمَا مَنَعَ النَّاسَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا إِذْ جَاءَهُمُ الْهُدَى And what prevented them from believing when guidance came to them, meaning the Qur'an. Sometimes the Torah is called Huda before its corruption. We find this likewise. وَلَقَدَ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْهُدَى We have certainly given Musa the guidance, meaning the Torah. Sometimes it is Tawheed and Sharia. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ It is he who sent his messenger with Huda. Meaning the oneness of Allah, the message of Sharia, everything in the deen. Sometimes it refers to the way, the way of the prophets. The way the prophets carried out their mission, the way they were. And this is mentioned in the Qur'an when Allah Ta'ala says, فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقَتَدِي He says to the Prophet wasallam, Emulate their guidance. Now he's not telling the Prophet wasallam to emulate the, prophet, the other prophets. Because he's their leader. But he's saying emulate 
their guidance, which is what Allah reveals. Likewise, it means inspiration, meaning that instinct that animals and human beings have. And this is mentioned in the Quran, أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى He has given everything its form and then guided it, meaning its instinct. It also means doing the right thing. فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ Their commerce was not uh, profitable, nor were they guided, meaning they weren't doing right. It could also mean dying as a Muslim. Dying as a Muslim can be referred to as huda. As Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Taha, وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اهْتَدَى I am the forgiving for the one who repents and believes and does righteous works and is then guided aright. This actually means dying in that state. So huda can sometimes mean dying as a Muslim. It could also mean to increase in knowledge. As Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Duha, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى Did we not find you perplexed and then guided you, meaning increased you in knowledge and proximity to the divine? Um, and then one of the meanings is thabat, to be firm. To be firm in what you have from Allah, your iman. And that meaning is found in إِهْدِنَا صِرَاطُ mustaqim, Guide us to the straight path. Meaning, make us firm. That's one of the meanings. طيب, so that's just some. I, just, I skipped a few. Um, it's a nice list. I can send you this list if you want for, for reference. It's one of those things you need to look at time and again to keep you refreshed. These are the 15 or so meanings or contexts in which the word Huda is mentioned in the Qur'an. So we mentioned earlier the definition of Hidayah linguistically according to Imam al-Raghib al-Asfahani. He talks about Hidayah from a Qur'anic perspective, looking at all of the verses that mention guidance. And he says that the guidance of Allah Ta'ala is broadly four types. I put them here on the board. The first type is the guidance needed for personal welfare in the world, meaning the guidance of instinct, of inner disposition, the guidance whereby you have natural impulses to seek benefits and to avoid harms, the natural instinct to survive and thrive in the world, that instinct, that natural disposition is a form of guidance. When a child instinctually suckles at the breast of his mother, that is guidance, the instinct to suckle. When animals do the same, this is the hidayah of Allah for them to behave in that pattern. So this is a broad form of hidayah that encompasses all of creation, all sentient life, to behave in a certain pattern according to the instinct they have. We also find another meaning of guidance as showing people what benefits them religiously and concerning their hereafter. This is, what did I put on the board? Uh, being shown what benefits, meaning being shown what benefits them in this life and the next. And this is through signs, through prophets being sent, through books being revealed, shara'i' laws being established. And this is the hidayah of dalala and bayan, of clarification, of giving instruction. So this is the guidance we think of with revelation, with Qur'an, the Torah, the Injil, the Anbiya, and the instructions they gave to their people. This is all guidance showing people what will benefit them in this life and in the next. Then there's number three, which 
I just put here tawfiq, the guidance of tawfiq. And that is the guidance where Allah enables you to accept the guidance and embrace it. This is the tawf- this is the tawfiq whereby Allah places iman in the heart. Right? One of the du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was to say that whomsoever Allah guides, they are guided. And this is taken from the Quran. مَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدِي Right? وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ Right? فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ نَصِيرًا And whoever is misguided, you'll find no helper for that person. إِنَّ هُدَ اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَى This is the tawfiq. Allah giving you the ability to accept guidance through placing iman in your heart. And then lastly, according to Imam Raghb al-Asfahani, you have guidance on the path and guidance when crossing the sirat on the day of judgment. That's a form of guidance as well. So there's guidance to the path and there's guidance while on the path. There are many who are guided to the path, but they're not so stable. They lean left and right and they may fall off. So you want guidance to it and upon it. So he says guidance upon the path as well. Why is it important to know all of these things? It's because the word guidance has different context and that affects how we understand the Quran. And the chief example of this is the distinction between the guidance of explaining and clarifying and showing and pointing out the truth and the guidance of acceptance being given the ability to embrace that guidance these are two different things all together right a person can be shown guidance but they are they're not embracing it right and a person may embrace guidance but they're not always firm on the guidance we see in the quran that these two meanings uh, come in sharp contrast. We have a verse in the Quran where Allah Ta'ala says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Innaka la tahdi man ahbabt, which means you do not guide the one you love. This is referring to his uncle Abu Talib. Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, indeed you do not guide whom you love. In another verse, however, Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ In Surah Shura, Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Indeed, you do guide to the straight path. Is there a contradiction between these two verses? One verse is saying, you don't guide whom you love. The other verse says, you do guide to the straight path. So which one is it? The answer is both. But it's through understanding this two, there's different types of guidance. When Allah Ta'ala is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Inna la tahdi man ahbabt You do not guide whom you love. This means the guidance of tawfiq. The guidance of the ability to embrace the faith. Where iman is cast in the heart. The Prophet Sallallahu does not have that ability. That is for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But in the other verse... Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ You certainly guide to the straight path. That is referring to the guidance of irshad, dalala, bayan, explaining, clarifying, showing the way. You show the way. If the person embraces it, that's from the guidance of Allah, giving them the tawfiq to accept it. If they turn away from it, you have still guided them in so far as you explain to them what Allah has ordered you to explain. So there's these two main types of guidance. So you have a question? No. So this book says uh, on the path showing and then staying on the path and then saying like when you read the Surah, it says in here after that Surah. And Surah, is it better? Uh, right. So according according to Imam Al-Raghab al-Asfahani, the guidance referred to in the Quran in the different forms we find all return to these one of these four meanings 
And in the fourth meaning, he says it is guidance on the straight path as in, in this life, as well as guidance to cross safely the sirat, the actual literal physical bridge that is suspended over hell, that a person crosses on the day of judgment. So according to him, the guidance is, not, is in this life as well as in the next when crossing that. Right? Yeah. Yes, to right. So the technical meaning of tawfiq, according to the ulama, is an la yakil Allahu ila nafsik, that Allah does not entrust you to yourself, that Allah does not leave you to your own strength and power. That's tawfiq. So when Allah assists you, when He opens the doors for you, He makes the, the path smooth for you, when He facilitates things for you, he is enabling you to take that path. Right? Guidance has means. We take the means, like everything else in life. But everything is ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're sick, you, know, you can take medicine. Medicine is a means, but it is Allah ta'ala who creates the healing in conjunction with the medicine, not by the medicine. He doesn't need tools, but these are the means. So there are means of guidance, Right? And when you, see, you look at the psychology of Quraysh, you see that they didn't take the means of guidance. They had the means that led them further and further astray. The psychological qualities of arrogance and pride and uh, stubbornness and rejection of anything because of that pride. So, yeah, so tawfiq is basically for Allah Ta'ala to enable you to use the means, but to really open those doors and facilitate the right decisions. Yeah. So this is what we say regarding huda or hidayah as we piece together this verse, ihdina siratul mustaqim. We come now to the word sirat. So we're going to cover sirat and mustaqim and then put them all together. We come to the word sirat. And you'll notice here that it's spelled two different ways. Most people don't know this that the word sirat actually comes from the word sirat. And there's actually two ways of reciting it, according to the canonical recitations of the Qur'an. According to the qira'a of Qumbul from Ibn Kathir, not the Mufassir, but an earlier qari, and from Ruwais an Ya'qub, the verse is recited Listen very carefully. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Whereas, according to the rest of the Qurra, it is recited with the Sad. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. So, there's two ways of reading it. The way of the majority is with the Sad. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. And according to Qunbul from Ibn Kathir and Ruwais from Yaqub, it is إِهْدِنَا السِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Why is this the case? Because it is pronounced as seen according to the majority of the Arabs in the pre-modern period, ancient times, outside of the Hijaz. They would pronounce it as Sirat which is the root of this word, it's from Sirat. Whereas the people of Hijaz, Mecca and Medina and in between, they would pronounce it as Sirat. The reason why is because we have in the Arabic language what we call Badal. Badal, I don't know the exact English equivalent term for this. In, in, it just means replacement, but the, the idea is that when you have a heavy letter and a soft letter, it's often very heavy on the tongue. So the Arabs would often engage in this replacement where they would replace the soft with the hard or the hard with the soft, right? So instead of saying, 
where seen is soft and ta is heavy, the people of Hijaz would say the word sirat as sirat, because sad and ta go together, heavy and heavy, as opposed to soft then heavy. And there's other words like this too, um, and there's different forms, right? In Surah Yusuf, what dakara ba'da ummatin, what dakara ba'da ummatin, it's it's uh, from the root form of dakara, but there's no dal in the in the form. What dakara is where dal is replaced by dal because if you didn't do that, it would be idh takara. So the ta is replaced to it's it's sarf. It's one of these sciences of Arabic. So the people of Hijaz recited or they said the word sirat as sirat. And this is in the Quran, but when you look at the meaning of the word sirat in the Arabic dictionaries, if you look up, look it up under sad ra ta, you're going to find it referring you back to seen ra ta. This is the the root of this word uh, sirat with the sad. So sa ra ta, we say sarita in in the original Arabic. Sarita, sarita means ibtala'a, uh, to swallow or to engulf, right? Who knows the word for cancer in Arabic? Saratan, saratan with a, with a scene, saratan is from sarita, because it engulfs and basically consumes the person, right? Um, the word, the, the constellation, the cancer, the, the cancer constellation. In Arabic, that's also called saratan, because another word for, the word saratan can also mean crab. And cancer is the Latin word for crab. So you have all these interesting linguistic connections. Oh, it's a typo. Okay, shukran. Oh, yeah. I see what I did there. Yeah, so it is from sarita with a with seen, which means to gulp or to swallow. And I was thinking about this, why the Arabs would call a path, a road, a sirat from sarita, which means to swallow or to engulf. And I started thinking about swallowing, and I started thinking about the esophagus. If you see the tajweed diagrams, when you learn tajweed, you see the mouth, you see the placement of the tongue, and then you see the esophagus. Or the anatomy textbook, you see that in the process of swallowing, the esophagus is this straight thing going down, right? Maybe that's where it comes from, I don't know, but sarita, to swallow or to engulf, became the word the Arabs coin for a path or a road, a tariq or a sabil and so on. So that's what it means linguistically. What does it mean in this verse though? Is the sirat in this verse a physical road? Is it a physical path? Could be. So you say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Well, if we're talking about dunya, well, if you've, you have to first define what is the sirat al-mustaqim. Because if that thing is physical, then yes. But if it's not a physical entity, then it's something, there's something else going on here. Right? Right, so in Arabic, like English and other languages, you have uh, what we call metonym, where you use one word for another thing. You, you borrow, essentially. When you say, for example, uh, if you go to old, the old periods of monarchy, where there's kings and queens, and you'd have lands that belong to the king or queen, they would say, these lands belong to the crown. Do the lands literally belong to the physical crown? The crown, the taj, 
or the iklil, whatever you call it. Do the lands belong to the crown, the physical crown? No. But the word taj or crown is borrowed, it's used to refer to the, the king's authority and dominion. In Arabic we call this isti'ara. It's very common in the Quran. So the word sirat is musta'ar. It's a metonym. It's not a physical road as such. It's what we call figure of speech in a sense. Right? So this is what sirat means by itself. So we explained ihdina, the meanings of huda and hidayah, the various forms. We explained sirat and sirat and the linguistic meaning and the basic Arabic meaning. We want to now explain mustaqim and then put all three together. What is mustaqim? Mustaqim is from, it's a noun from the verb istaqama, yastaqimu. Mustaqim means upright. When you say qama yaqumu, it means so and so stood up. So istaqama means to be upright, to be straight, to be without crookedness and without swerves. According to Imam al Razi, mustaqim means that this path, this sirat, is mustaqim in that it's smooth and even and has no roughness. Smooth, even, and no roughness. Think of a well-trodden path. It doesn't have rocks that you're going to stub your toe on. It doesn't have shrubs you're going to trip on. It doesn't have cracks and things like that. It's straight, it's smooth, it's even, and there's no roughness on it. Meaning you can walk straight on it without tripping up. This is what he says for mustaqim. This word mustaqim is also musta'ar. It's also a metonym. So it, what it means here is not that it's physically, a, there's a physical road that we call a straight path. It means that it's clear, it's upright, it's straight, it's smooth, it's not littered with garbage, it's not filled with cracks and potholes and gaps and detours and anything like that. That's the basic meaning of mustaqim. So that when you're on that straight path, the path itself does not contain crookedness. The path itself does not contain, there's no feature of the path that would cause you to stumble. If you stumble on the path, it's not due to the path. It's due to something else with you or with people around you who are on the path or by swerving off of the path of your own choice. So it's not due to any inherent quality of the path that a person on the path would stumble and trip. This is why we say mustaqim as in smooth, even and without crookedness. So this is the meaning of sirat, the meaning of mustaqim, linguistically, and in the general sense within this ayah where we make this dua, ihdina sirat al mustaqim. But now we have to put it all together. And this is where we see the meaning of that dua expressed. When we go to the books of tafsir, we see that the ulama from the earliest period had many different things to say about what constitutes the straight path. You have some who said that the straight path is Islam itself. You have some who say it is the deen of Islam, deen al-haq. You have some who say that the straight path is the Qur'an. And you have some who say that it is the Prophet ﷺ himself. You see lots of different interpretations. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are these differences differences where only one can be right and the others are wrong? Or can they all be right? They're all, they're, they're all right in their own way. 
And that is because one of the principles of tafsir we learn is that the differences in tafsir are two types. The first type they call ikhtilaf tanawr, which means a difference in variation, such as this. This is not a fundamental difference. And then you have ikhtilaf tadal, which you have, which is complete contradiction, a difference of where one has to be right and one has to be wrong. They can't both be right. In this tafsir, we see those who say Islam, Quran, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi al-Haq. These are differences of variation. They are all right in their own way. They're all right in their own way because each of these is what constitutes the straight path in, in, in the broad sense. Islam and Dinul Haq is not the same thing? It is the same thing. It's just they would use different words, right? Now, if you say Islam, so there's two types of Islam, isn't there? There's the Islam with a capital I, and then there's Islam with a lowercase i. According to us, all of the prophets are upon Islam in the lowercase i. But they had different sharia. They had different rulings about halal and haram. Islam with a capital I is the Islam, meaning the way, the sharia brought by the Prophet Sallallahu that abrogates those previous laws. If someone clings to the way of a previous prophet, which is a lowercase i, Islam, but rejects the uppercase Islam, the capital I Islam, they're not Muslim. It's not accepted from them. So... Sometimes you see the difference. Din al-Haq, the, the way of truth. According to many of the ulama, they say simply the straight path is the primordial path of guidance established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our day and age, it is the path brought by the Prophet sallallahu In the time of Bani Israel, it would have been the way of Sayyidina Musa, or whatever a prophet from Bani Israel brought. Um, for any other nation, it would have been whatever their prophet brought. Because every prophet called their community to the straight path that Allah gave them. This is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-A'raf, when shaitan refuses to bow to Adam, and he's going to be ejected. What does he say? He says, قَالَ فَبِمَا أَغَوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ سِرَاطِكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Because you have led me astray, I will certainly sit and lie in wait for them on your straight path. He's referring to the way of guidance that Allah has established. So this means that when you hear the word إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ It's as-sirat with alif lam. Remember that among the meanings of alif and lam is encompassment. Another meaning of alif and lam is al-ahd or al-ahd al-dhihni which means you're referencing uh, known information by way of prior mention, something you mentioned before. Right? So this means that as-sirat al-mustaqim means the one straight path that Allah Ta'ala has established for all of the prophets and messengers sent to humanity. Any way that deviates from their way is a crooked path. Right? So there's a, the broad straight path that all the prophets brought. And there's the specific straight path, which is the final dispensation, the final way brought by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. So when... For us, yes. Yeah. He is the embodiment of that way. Right? So according to Mamar Razi, the Alif and Lam here refers to the straight path, which is the way of Tawheed and high ethics that Allah gave all of the prophets, which has a specific articulation in what was given to the Prophet ﷺ. But it is the path that is shared by all of the previous prophets in the general sense that it's the straight path of guidance. Now, it may differ in application from age to age, 
Sharia to Sharia, but it's the straight path, the way of Allah. Yeah. Sure. Right, so the, what's, the, what's the opposite of straight? Crooked, right? Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. Allah says in the opening of Surah Al-Kahf, Alhamdulillah, who revealed the book to his servant and did not place therein any crookedness. So when you say a person is mustaqim, they are physically upright meaning they're standing up straight with good posture. If they're not upright and they have bad posture, they have lordosis or kyphosis or scoliosis, but they're crooked in whatever way it is, they're crooked. So when you say mustaqim, it, think of straight, even with balance and not crooked. It's not swerving this way or that way. For a, a road, a physical road, it, it's straight. For a person, it means they have good posture, they're upright. So because this word is not referring to a literal road, we can say mustaqim is upright. We don't mean an upright road going vertical, right? Because it's not a literal road. But we mean it's a path, a way that is upright. Meaning it's not crooked, it's even, it's straight. And as Imam Razi says and others, the reason why we ask Allah to guide us to the straight path is because the quickest way to a, from point A to point B is a straight line. The quickest way to get from point A to point B is a straight line. If you take a circuit, circu- uh, I'm going to leave that word, a crooked route, a route that's taking you through detours and stops and going here and there all around, this is not a straight path. It takes you longer to get there. If there's multiple detours, there's greater dangers on the road, right? And this, you think about it, we, we have highways, we have automobiles. You think about the psychological changes that makes to human beings, having the ability to get into a large metal box and drive hundreds of miles by themselves on an open road without worrying about human beings or animals or even the elements. Psychologically, that gives you a sense of freedom and a feeling of safety that people before the age of the automobile would not have had. In a prior age, to go from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia is no easy trip. Not only is it difficult because of the weather and the road conditions. It can also be very dangerous depending on who's lying on, on the road or maybe you're stopping and you know a bear comes or something like that. Whereas if you get on the highway and drive, I mean, there's still some dangers obviously, but if you have gas and food, you have heat in your car, you drive, right? So the route that is crooked and going here and there is going to be inevitably more dangerous than a straight route that gets you there quicker than other routes. And because it's straight, you don't fear that you're getting lost or getting detoured by taking side paths. All right, so there's, a, there's the imagery of a straight path that is understood by people in the pre-automobile age, but it's not referring to an actual physical road. It's referring to a meaning, which is the guidance of Allah Ta'ala that is swerving away, or it's not swerving here and there. There's no detours or crookedness. And it avoids any of these other paths that have those features. And we're going to see that as we look at the meaning of this together. Imam Aranzi says that the reason we say guide us to the straight path is because the quickest, point, the quickest way from point A to point B is a direct line. Why do we ask for the straight path? because we don't rely on ourselves to be brave enough and strong enough to deal with the dangers inherent in a crooked, long, difficult path that goes here and there. We ask for the straightest, quickest way. It's as if a person is saying, Ya Allah, I am weak and can only manage the quickest way from point A to point B. I want to avoid all of these other routes that have danger. 
the crooked path may not take you where you're trying to go. The straight path takes you directly to your destination. The straight path doesn't alter. It's just a straight path. A crooked path can take you here, it can take you there. It's going all over the place. And you're not seeing your destination clearly by just staying on the path. You're going all over the place. So in the Qur'an, we see that this term, Sirat Mustaqim, is used in different ways. And this helps us understand what does it mean when we ask Allah to guide us to the straight path. In some verses, the Sirat Mustaqim, the straight path, refers to the way of the Anbiya, the way of the Prophets. We find in Surah Yasin, Allah Ta'ala says, Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam, alla ta'budu shaytan, innahu lakum aduun mubin, wa ani'buduni, hadha siratun mustaqim. Do we not take a covenant from you, O children of Adam, that you do not worship shaytan, indeed he is to you an open enemy, and that you worship me alone? That is the straight path. So that means, one of the meanings of the straight path is, Ibadatullah, the worship of Allah alone. We also find in the story of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam in Surah Zukhruf, he says, وَلَمَّا جَاءَ Isa بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالَ قَالَ جِئْتُكُمْ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَلَيُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي تَخْتَرِفُونَ فِيهِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُوا هَذَا سِرَاطٌ مُسْتَقِيمٌ he says essentially the same thing. The message he gives to the people, clarifying to them and explaining the things wherein they were differing. He said, Have taqwa of Allah and obey me. Indeed, your Lord and my Lord is Allah. Worship Him alone. That is a straight path. So the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We also find a hadith, and if you look here at the bottom, you'll see a diagram. The bottom left, there's a diagram. This is actually an instance where the Prophet Sallallahu taught by drawing in the sand. He would use imagery in his teaching. This is one instance. And in this hadith is in Bukhari and other collections, and it mentions خط رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خطا بيده ثم قال هذا سبيل الله مستقيما قال ثم خط عن يمينه وشماله ثم قال هذه السبل ليس منها سبيل إلا عليه شيطان يدعو إليه ثم قرأ وأن هذا صراطي مستقيما فاتبعوه وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ السُّبُلْ So this hadith mentions that the Prophet ﷺ once drew a line in the sand with his blessed hand, and it was a straight line. And he said, this is the straight path of Allah. He used the word sabil, which means path, similar to sirat. This is the upright, straight path of Allah. And then he drew lines to the right and to the left of it. So the more accurate representation would be to make that vertical. If I lifted it so the line is going up, you'd have lines going to the, to the right and lines going to the left, squiggly lines. He drew these lines and then he said, these paths uh, are the other paths. At the head of each, there is a shaitan inviting others to it. These are the paths that lead people astray. And at the head of them, there is a shaitan on each, inviting others to it. And then he recited the verse, Indeed, this is my straight path, so follow it, and do not follow the other paths. So, the path of Allah, the path of the Prophet wasallam, Islam, the deen, the Qur'an, the sunnah, all of these things, they have the same meaning. This is the sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path. Now, there's a couple of issues we want to finish talking about here. And this is what I consider to be the, 
the essence of this tafsir. We, we learn the adab of dua and we say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ According to Shaykh Ahmad ibn Ajiba, rahimahullah, he says that in this verse, Allah Ta'ala is teaching us how we should ask from Him. And we say, guide us. Meaning, show us the straight path that will cause us to arrive at your divine grace and pleasure. He says that the straight path is the path that gathers between the sharia and the haqiqa, the sharia and the inward realities. Or you could say the inward and the outward. The zahir and the batin. Right. Is you're asking Allah Ta'ala to guide you to the straight path which unites between these two things. To unite the inward with the outward, the outward with the inward, zahir and batin. Right? So he's pairing these things. He's saying, guide us to the straight path that unites these two things. Why is he saying that? Because as we see in the next verses, we are presented with two types of people, two archetypes. Those who go astray and those who incur the anger of Allah. And we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail, who they are and what are their signs. But what you see there are two contrasting paths. So you have on the one hand, غير المغضوب عليهم, right? These are the people who may have the outward only, but they don't have the inward. And the ضالين, they're lost. They have some inward, but they have no outward. So you're asking Allah to guide you to the straight path that unites these dichotomies, that unites inward and outward, sharia and haqiqa, right? Um, and this applies to so many other things in deen. Trusting in Allah Ta'ala while also using the means. Tawakkul and asbab. Right? If you only use the means and you don't trust in Allah Ta'ala, that's a problem. That's a direct uh, violation of tawheed. And if you trust in Allah Ta'ala but neglect the asbab, the, the means, this is a neglect of sharia. So you unite the two, right? So guidance on the straight path is uniting between those two things. Knowledge in action. Some people, they like, to, they like to learn and they like book knowledge, but they don't practice it. Other people aren't really interested in learning. They just want to do stuff, but they don't have knowledge and they make mistakes and they create problems. So uniting between knowledge and practice, that is the straight path. So he's saying that you're, you're asking Allah Ta'ala to guide you to integrate these two things in their various forms. Inward, outward, knowledge and practice, right? Trusting in Allah Ta'ala while using the means, all of this. But there's, so we have the general and specific meaning of this dua, to guide us to the straight path. But there's one unanswered question that I believe is the most important question to ask. In the previous verses, what do we have? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm Ad-Din, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. The servant is affirming, you alone we worship, and in your help alone we seek. This person who's making this dua, they're a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, correct? Yeah. Right. If you are a true abid of Allah, you have to be a believer, correct? If you're a believer, you have guidance, don't you? You're guided, right? So if you're guided already, why are you asking Allah? to give you guidance if you're already guided. This is the most important question. Now once you know what the Sirat al-Mustaqim is in its various interpretations, 
The question is, if you already have guidance, and you do, why are you asking Allah for it at least 17 times a day? Some may argue that this is an example of tahsil al-hasil, or seeking to get what you already have, which is a kind of absurdity, right? If, if you know, say this is my phone, and it's my phone, and I ask you, hand me my phone. You hand me the phone. I have the phone in my hand, and I look at you and say, hand me my phone. I already, you already handed me the phone. Why am I asking you again? There's, a, there's an absurdity to that because I already have what I asked you to give me. So if you're a believer and you have guidance, why are you asking Allah to give you what you already have? There's, of course, a lot of answers to that that the ulama give. Um, we're asking for firmness, right? That's, that's one of the meanings of guidance is firmness upon truth. So you're not asking for what you don't have. You're asking for firmness and stability in what you have. So you're asking Allah to make you firm on the straight path. This is one way of looking at it. Imam al-Razi, he says that for every character trait, there are two extremes. There's ifrat and tafrit. There's uh, excess or extremes. And then there's laxity. Right? For example, bravery is a virtue. If it goes to, the, to excess, we call that... What's the word in English? We call that uh, recklessness. Right? Being foolhardy and reckless. If it goes too far to laxity, we call that cowardice. They're a coward. Right? So they're either a hothead on the one extreme or they're a coward. We don't want to be either of those two things. We want to be brave. If a person has bravery as a virtue, they have avoided this extreme of laxity and that extreme of excessiveness. So Imam Razi says, Every character trait is between two extremes. And once a person knows Allah Ta'ala, he says they need guidance on how to worship Him and attain balance. So when they say, إِهْدِنَا صِرَاطُ mustaqim," they're asking Allah to be shown the way that is between excess and laxity. Right? This, to be straight means you're not going this way or you're not going that way. You're not going to extremes and you're not becoming negligent. So he says this means you're asking Allah to guide you in your path of Islam to avoid extremes and to avoid negligence. Because people talk about extremism, right? Extreme, at least in English, to swerve, to go this way. But it could really go either way. People think, oh, they're an extremist, you know, a religious extremist. Um, if a person is negligent of the rights of Allah and the rights of hu- human beings, they're also in an extreme. Just as the person who goes to extremes in severity and making things hard on themselves and others, that's also an extreme. Imam al-Razi also says that the Sirat al-Mustaqim is, this is, I think, his most important point. He says that the straight path is the totality of Islam. Beliefs, statements, actions, character, and so on. So when you're asking Allah to guide you to the straight path, you're asking Allah to guide you in your beliefs, guide you in what you say, guide you in your actions, guide you in your character. So when you're asking Allah to guide you in all of these things, you are asking Allah to guide you so that you can properly live Islam. Because we believe we have guidance, but our statements and actions and our internal conditions, they vary, they swerve, they go back and forth. So you're asking Allah to give you stability and firmness in living Islam, expressing your beliefs, your statements, your actions, 
your character, how you are with other people, and so on. So that is the guidance. So this is how Imam al-Razi explains it. Um, other Imams say, you're asking for guidance because your states always change. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu mentions Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. So if a person is a Muslim, but they have not yet attained the level of being mu'min in the truest sense, they say, إِهْدِنَا صِرَاطُ mustaqim," Meaning, guide me from in the path of Islam to the station of Iman. And if they have Iman, but they have not yet attained Ihsan, they say, إِهْدِنَا صِرَاطُ mustaqim," Guide me from the path of Iman to the path of Ihsan. So there's this continual process of drawing near to Allah Ta'ala that you're asking Allah to give you and to strengthen you. So this is an expression of neediness. That's the ultimate lesson, isn't it? When you're asking Allah to guide you, it's an expression of need. If you felt that guidance is a single thing you can latch onto and you either have it or you don't, what's the point of asking Allah for it if you already have it? But if you recognize your neediness and the need for stability and firmness and direction, you ask Allah Ta'ala continuously for guidance. If a person didn't ask for guidance continuously, they may come to a point where they think that their guidance is from their own intelligence. I am a Muslim because I am smarter than those kafirs. I am a Muslim and I have a proper belief because I am smarter. They're just dumb. If they were only as intelligent as me, they too would be guided. There are Muslims who have guidance and firm iman, and they're illiterate villagers. And there are astrophysicists who are, you know, 125, 130 IQs who are atheists. So intelligence itself is not an indication of one's guidance. So if a person isn't seeking the guidance of Allah and acknowledging their neediness for it, they could be falling into this trap thinking that their guidance is because of their own intelligence and wits. And that's nothing to do with it whatsoever. Allah Ta'ala does appeal to the aql. He appeals to the rational faculty to think and reflect. But ultimately, it's the guidance of Allah. And if Allah doesn't guide the person, they won't be guided. This is why we see in the Hadith Qudsi, mentioned by Imam al nawawi in his 40 Hadith collection, Ya ibadi, kullukum dal, illa man hadayt, fastahduni ahdikum. O oh my servants, all of you are misguided, except the ones I guide. So seek guidance from me, and I will guide you. And this is the tafsir of the verse, teaching us how to ask. By praising Allah, invoking His mercy, mentioning the Day of Judgment, expressing our sincerity in worship, seeking help, and then asking for guidance. Now what comes after this is a more detailed explanation of what the straight path is and what it is not. This is important because the next verse and the verse after gives us more detail linking the Sirat al-Mustaqim to specific archetypes, specific types of people. And then there's the verse explaining what it is not by explaining two different types of individuals that are not on the straight path. So you put all of that together to have the deep understanding of Surah Al-Fatiha. Wallahu wa rasuluhu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.